Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today at the American Veterans Center Conference by U.S. Army Vietnam veteran and Judge Vincent Okamoto. And sir, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. Your story uh, begins in a very interesting way because you were born in a Japanese internment camp, correct? Correct. Uh, where were you born and what were, the, what were the conditions for your family at that time? I was born in post and relocation camp number one. Uh, and I have no independent recollection of it. Uh, my family was interned there for a little over three years. So I was like two years old when we left camp. But from what uh, I can glean from the stories of my older brothers and sisters, um, it was kind of a Spartan existence. They lived in barracks, um, five people to a room. There was no indoor plumbing. Uh, for toilets, they had to walk through a communal latrine, and uh, for meals, they had to go to a, a uh, mess hall. So what they described to me most vividly was the fact that everything you did required standing in line for a long time. Now, as a result of that, whether it's with your siblings or your parents, was there any lingering bitterness towards the United States over that? You know, perhaps that's one of the things that I'm most grateful to my family. There was no bitterness. In fact, I'm the last of 10 kids and the seventh son, and all of my six old brothers served in the military, two with the uh, famed 442nd during Red, uh, World War II, another brother volunteered for the Marines and fought in the Korean War. So uh, their message and their example to us was, this is our country and if necessary, we have to fight for it. So then, years later, you're in college, and you get involved with the ROTC of a different college. How did that work? I got a scholarship to uh, University of Southern California for international relations, which is what I wanted to do. And they were drafting about 30,000 guys a month at that point in time. The Vietnam War was really heating up. Uh, so I figured, all right, I'll join the ROTC and at least uh, know I'll be able to get my degree. Well, they didn't have an Army ROTC at USC. Uh, it was Navy and Air Force. And I didn't want to go into the Air Force and I didn't have the 2020 vision for the, for the Navy. Uh, so I heard that the, across town at UCLA, they did have an Army ROTC. So for the last two years of my college uh, career, it was, it was kind of grim because I'd have to commute to both schools each day. Uh, the one good thing was uh, no matter who won the Rose Bowl, uh, I could get tickets. <laughs> I was just going to ask, when they play each other, who do you cheer for? Uh, I, I didn't go to those games. <laughs> <laughs> you win either way. There, there you go. All right. So then you, of course... After you graduate, you are an officer yes. now in the United States Army, and then you decided to go to ranger school. Why did you pursue that? Um, well, I figured they were going to send me to Vietnam anyway, so if I was going to go, I'd want to be uh, trained as best I could, serve with the guys that were trained, and uh, I think it was kind of a no-brainer, really, um, ranger school. If nothing else, after nine weeks and losing about 30 pounds, you know how to run a small unit patrol. And for that, I'm very grateful because it certainly helped in Vietnam. When were you deployed to Vietnam? Uh, 1968, 1969. Okay. And the day, of course, that you'll never forget, I'm sure, is August 24th. It's a bad day. At Da Chiang. Um, what was the location? Talk about what you were defending at that point. We were about a quarter mile from the Cambodian border, and they had picked the location for us uh, to block an infiltration route. And everything seemed fine. Uh, we, I was with a rifle company, and about 10 o'clock that morning, or that night, uh, the most intense mortar barrage I've ever experienced fell on us. When, uh, I looked through my starlight scope, 
and I literally saw hundreds of North Vietnamese regulars charging the perimeter. Um, and it got kind of, it got kind of uh, terminal. Um, we fought for about three hours. Uh, we came very close to being overrun, and about uh, a little over 40 guys were killed that night, 40 Americans. Um, they didn't enter the perimeter. We beat them back, but uh, paid a high price for being in that location. You mentioned the 40 that were lost. How big was the group defending? Uh, about 150 all told. Wow, so over a quarter. Yeah. What was your immediate thinking with this barrage you've never seen of this kind of intensity? Are you thinking about the other men? Are you thinking about how to respond effectively? What's the first thing that comes to mind in that situation? I wish I was closer to a bunker. Um, you hit, you hit the ground. Um, kind of upset because your buttons are keeping you from going deeper into the ground. You know, I, I for one didn't think about the men or anything else at the time. I just wanted to protect myself from all the metal that was flying through the air, and that lasted for quite a while because what what happened was that the North Vietnamese mortar gunners, and they were good would walk their shells into the perimeter, and then the, their infantry would follow the barrage. Uh, so what was hard is that when there were still round mortar rounds coming in, you could see their infantry coming towards you. So you had to, you had to get up and put out suppressing fire. And that was hard for the guys because there's a lot of shrapnel flying through the air and now the North Vietnamese are close enough to fire their AK-47. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of metal flying through the air at that point in time. But you had to do it because if you stayed on the ground or stayed in the bunkers, you'd be overrun. So uh, we had no choice. We, we stood and fought because uh, otherwise we'd just get overrun and be killed. From what I've read, you led about five other men in response to this. What did you do and how did you do it? You know, the, the main attack came on the other side of the perimeter, on the north side. We were, my platoon was responsible for the southern portion. But after the mortars, we started taking so much intense ground fire. I said, something's wrong. Uh, when I looked over, um, two of the machine guns on the north perimeter stopped firing. And so I figured uh, they'd been knocked out, and uh, if we didn't do something, North Vietnamese would come into the perimeter. So I, had, I think I had five bunkers I was responsible for. I picked uh, five guys who I knew would stand and fight rather than uh, pull back. Took them to the northern part of the perimeter, and uh, it was like I, I thought, uh, three armored personnel carriers had been uh, destroyed with rocket-propelled grenades. There was one tank there that had, was on fire, being hit with a rocket-propelled grenade. And the two machine guns from the second platoon that was responsible for the northern sector, uh, they were hit with RPGs and grenades. And a lot of the guys were just turned into long division problems. Uh, you knew who they were, but you wouldn't recognize them. Uh, so myself and those five brave men, uh, we held them off for about, I, I would say about 30, 40 minutes. And we were able to put out enough suppressing fire that uh, we blunted the attack. Now, you mentioned some of the guns that were around. The rest of this story, or at least another part of this story, is you personally going from gun to gun and dodging a lot of fire. Explain what you're thinking and how you managed to do that tactically. Each armored personnel carried, there are three of them, carried a 50 caliber heavy machine gun. But all the guys who were manning that initially had been killed. So I think I yelled out to one of the, to my guys, hey, when you go man that machine gun, uh, there was no positive response. In fact, one guy just said, shit, <laughs> no. Um, 
you know, it sounds corny, but like in, they teach you in infantry school, don't ask your men to do something you weren't willing to do. We needed that machine gun put into operation. No one was going to go out there and, and do it because the lead was flying pretty hot and heavy. So I ran to that armed personnel carrier and climbed aboard, manned that 50 cal machine gun, which is really an awesome weapon. Uh, and I started uh, spraying the North Vietnamese with, that, with the 50 caliber, and then uh, ran out of ammo. And I'm high and dry, everybody's shooting at me because I'm on the top of that APC in about 30 yards to the side with another armored personnel carrier. So I jumped off the first one, ran to the second one, climbed the board, met its machine gun, fired uh, that until the ammo ran, ran out. And again, that 50 caliber was, uh, it doesn't matter if you're hiding behind a bush or a tree, or that 50 caliber is going to cut the, cut the tree in half. Uh, one final APC. Uh, and I don't know if it was uh, on fire or not. They, I heard two different stories. I, I don't recall, but I do recall running to that third APC. And uh, I resumed suppressive fire on the North Vietnamese, keeping on the perimeter. And then uh, the machine gun itself was hit by an AK round. And it, just the, the concussion of kinetic energy knocked me back. Uh, I went up and the machine gun was jammed. It was that I don't know what the round did to it, but it wouldn't fire. So I'm sitting up there cursing because I can't fire the machine gun. And I looked, and through the flares, I could see a group of uh, North Vietnamese soldiers setting up a machine gun. Uh, and I knew if they set that machine gun up, because all the positions had been knocked out on the northern sector. They kept it suppressing far on the whole eastern sector and the western sector. Sir, let me pause you right there. We'll pick up the story in just a moment. Okay. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, joined today by U.S. Army Vietnam veteran and judge Vincent Okamoto. And, sir, you were just in the middle of your uh, vivid story about seeing the threat after you've gone from armored personnel carrier to armored personnel carrier, three different ones in fact, and then you perceived a new threat. All of the five guys that uh, I chose to come with me to block the uh, gap in the perimeter had been wounded. Uh, and I see through the light of the flares a group of North Vietnamese pulling a heavy Soviet wheeled machine gun, and I knew that uh, if they got set up, they could sweep the entire western perimeter. So uh, I got about four grenades from the armored personnel carrier, and they were about 50 yards uh, beyond the barbed wire of our perimeter. And uh, I was able to crawl through a ditch uh, until I got to maybe 10 yards from the machine gun team. I pulled the the pins from the four grenades and just started pitching them uh, on the, to the other side of the ditch where the North Vietnamese were. And uh, I knocked out the machine gun crew. Uh, and I don't know, I, someone must have been left alive or maybe it was somewhere in a different position I couldn't see. But having thrown those four grenades, uh, another potato masher or North Vietnamese grenade dropped into the ditch. I tried to jump out, but uh, from the waist down, I didn't make it. My grenade went off. I tumbled through the air. Um, I knew I, I, mean, I was alive. I didn't know how bad I was hit. But then when I see more North Vietnamese come again, uh, I got up and I was able to run and limp back into the perimeter. My people helped pull me in. Um, again, I didn't, I wasn't hit uh, critically. There was no injury to the bone because I could still fire my M16 and, and walk around. So we fought for maybe another half hour. And finally, uh, 
they broke off the attack as it started to get light. And uh, we established the perimeter, we redistributed the ammunition and dragged all the our wounded to the center of the perimeter where there was two medics working on them. Uh, that, was, that was a bad night, bad night. Very much so. I want to go back to when you're engaging them from the guns on the a APCs, what kind of protection did you have? Because obviously you're being fired at a lot. How did you avoid being hit, do you think? Two of them had a turret. And it, it, it offered some protection, but your head and shoulders would be above the perimeter, or above the turret, rather. So uh, I'm one of the luckiest people in the world because I had maybe, I don't know, 100 North Vietnamese shooting at me. And the rounds were going over my head, they're going uh, on each side, they're pinging off the APC. and. Uh, I didn't get hit. I mean, the wounds I got that night were from a grenade, but uh, you don't think about things like that. And when the sun came up and the North Vietnamese were, were gone, uh, I started feeling the pain. But then when I also started thinking about all the AK rounds coming in, and I think literally there are thousands of rounds coming in. And that's when I started to shake and get scared. And uh, I told my RTO, my radio telephone operator, I said, hey, don't ever let me do that again. And he said, sure, I won't. <laughs> but you outranked him, so he really couldn't tell you not to do that again, right? Um, how long did it take you to process it? You mentioned shaking the day after. How long was it before you? About, uh, I guess it was about 8 o'clock, helicopters came in with reinforcements, ammunition, uh, and to dust off or to evacuate the wounded. So uh, by then, the medic had uh, hit me with a little bit of morphine, patched up the bigger holes in me. Uh, I jumped up on, on that helicopter. And that was maybe when I was the most frightened because we knew the North Vietnamese were in the surrounding tree line. And I was just waiting for a rocket propelled grenade or AK rounds to just shoot us down. And uh, I was tense. There were five other wounded guys in there. Uh, the dappled aluminum floor was, was greasy and oily with blood. And it wasn't until we had reached about 500 feet elevation, which I knew was beyond the effective range of an AK. Her, uh, I, I sighed a, a breath of relief and uh, just let the morphine kind of take me away mentally. Uh, how long did it take you to recover from the grenade wounds? Oh man, uh, again, I was really lucky. There was maybe I think the doc said he took out about 30 pieces. Um, it's kind of interesting because he said, uh, you know, the shrapnel's going to, your body, the muscles will naturally try to get rid of the shrapnel so they'll move to the surface of the skin. And then you could start popping them out like pimples. And, uh, you know, uh, most of them were on my back or my side, but it, it was true. I, I was the life of the party when I came home. You know, I said, hey, you want to see me pop out some shrapnel? I go, yeah. Squeeze an arm. Uh, I, was, I was glad, though, when that, uh, that little entertainment ceased to, <laughs> to exist. I can imagine that got a little old for you anyway. Uh, sir, we'll take another quick break. Be right back with our last segment in just a moment on Veterans Chronicles. We are back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by U.S. Army veteran, U.S. V or Vietnam War veteran, and Judge Vincent Okamoto. And sir, uh, we've talked obviously about the horrific events of, of August 1968. I wanted to get a, a little bit more of an idea of what your duties had been leading up to that during your tour in Vietnam. 
as a, as a ranger, as an officer, what were you and your men doing? Initially, I was assigned uh, as a rifle platoon leader. And we just stomped around the jungle uh, looking for North Vietnamese. Uh, I then took over a company, a rifle company, where I had uh, three platoons under me. Um, then I went up to uh, S3 to be a battalion intelligence officer. And I worked very closely with the Special Forces on what they call the Phoenix Program. So you learn that there's nothing more wretched in the world than being in the infantry. Uh, you're just out there slogging around in the, in the rice paddy water and in the swamps. Uh, I think one of the hardest things was uh, the war went on seven days a week. War went on all through the holidays. I think the first time when the, when the monsoon season started, uh, the rain came down. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm being pelted with these big globs of water. I'm thinking, you know what? Uh, in America, when it rains, people go indoors. Uh, we're just like bears. <laughs> We, we, we live out there. Uh, the only part that's going to be dry is the top of your head because you got a helmet on. But for 19, 20 year old kids, and that's who I had in my platoon, uh, it was a wretched experience. Um, it, took, it took maybe a month before a newbie, an FNG, a fucking new guy, uh, could be acclimated and also learn the lessons he need to know. Uh, until then, that's why the, the new guys are treated so badly, because the old timers would say, hey, I made it this far, and now I have this stupid kid from back just in the world. Uh, he's going to step on a mine or booby trap that's going to kill me, or he's not going to see the firing port of a bunker, and it's going to get me killed. Uh, it was tough on the new guys. It was really tough on the new guys because no one wanted them around. They were afraid of them. And it, it was a cruel experience, but that was part of the ritual of being in Vietnam. If you were an FNG, uh, you are a pariah until you proved yourself. What was your experience in that role when you first got there? Um, second lieutenants in the infantry are kind of like being child molesters. Um, no one likes them. Um, most of the men that you command have more time in country, are more experienced. Uh, <laughs> I had one guy come up to me my first day. I was introducing myself to the men. And uh, this one guy says, you know, I'm not going to bother to know your name, Lieutenant, because probably in the next couple of weeks you're going to die anyway. And we've had three platoon leaders in the last three months. Uh, that was kind of bad for my morale, uh, but when I got more experienced, especially when I got to be a company commander, I get these new second lieutenants uh, and all fat and sassy wanting to win the war. And you say to yourself, uh, that joker's going to get good men killed until he learns what to do. Uh, so. Again, it's, it's, it's a rite of passage. You go through phases just, just like an insect, you know, from the larva to a mature insect. Uh, what was bad about Vietnam from a tactical standpoint is just about the time I knew I, I knew my job. I really knew what to do, what to look for, what to expect. Uh, they rotate you to, a, to another position in the rear or you go home. So it was kind of a revolving door. There really wasn't that built up experience that they had in Korea in World War II. So, you know, one famous Vietnam vet said that uh, we didn't fight a 10 year war. We fought a one year war 10 times. And I, I think that's, uh, there's a lot of merit in that. One of the things you mentioned earlier it was when you were on the helicopter and you were fearing that the helicopter would be shot down because you never knew where the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong 
were shooting from in the brush on patrols. How difficult was that, and how did you figure out in the dense areas where they might be? You know, in Vietnam, 90% of the contacts that the troops had with the enemy, North Vietnamese initiated. Um, if you take 100 men in an infantry platoon, and you're literally hacking your way through the jungle, they'll know, the North Vietnamese will know you're coming. Uh, 20 minutes before you get to their position. So they'll either set up an ambush or more probable, they'll pull back, go into their tunnels or just leave. So it was a never ending routine of uh, stomping around the jungle, looking for the North Vietnamese, hoping you didn't find them. But again, it was almost an impossible situation for the regular troops. You cannot go through the jungle quietly. Uh, these guys weren't Green Berets, they weren't uh, long-range patrols. Uh, they're American kids, most of them from the city. Uh, so again, the Vietnamese would always know where we were. We never knew where they were until they started shooting us or until uh, someone stepped on a booby trap. Wow. I see you have three Purple Hearts. Are all of those from the event we talked about in 1968, or were there other events? No, uh, they're all they're all from uh, June to August 1968. After uh, I got hit for the third time, um, they moved me up to be intelligence officer for the battalion, and it was like literally like night and day. Uh, I hung out with the with the guys in the headquarters uh, company. They didn't go on search and destroy. They don't go on night ambushes. They don't go on air assaults. So it's like, uh, you know, have your birthday, Vince, because this is your second chance of life. Uh, and the thing that was really hard is that leaving the men that you had served with and fought with, uh, guys that would die for you. Uh, I'm sitting back drinking a beer uh, in a battalion fire base, and those guys were still every day, every single day, going on a search and destroy mission, every third night going off into the jungle to pull, pull a night ambush. Uh, you know what? They were really magnificent. They, they, I, I cannot describe how much pride and how much respect I had for these guys. A lot of them, high school dropouts, a lot of them, uh, nothing to look forward to when they got back to America. Uh, but they were there fighting their tails off, uh, bleeding and sometimes dying for this country that uh, all too often seemed not to care about them. Did you ever ask to go back? No. I had. Uh, my fill of being the infantry. But again, I was with what they call the Phoenix program in the last uh, several months of my tour there, which was totally different, uh, much more effective than being in the infantry. The Phoenix program uh, tried to identify and target uh, what they call the Viet Cong infrastructure, the, uh, the civilians who were communist agents propaganda officers, tax collectors, and guides. So when the North Vietnamese would come south down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and then turn left to go into South Vietnam, they were strangers just like the Americans. They needed these, the VCI, to guide them around the American ambushes to show them where the ammunition and supply caches were. Um, after the war, most of the high-ranking North Vietnamese officers said they, they feared Phoenix more than an infantry division. Because you knock off their, their guides, uh, they're blind, they're just like us. They're, they're flapping around, stomping around the jungle, hoping to avoid the Americans. But Phoenix became very controversial. Um, some people said uh, it was an assassination program. Uh, 
like anything else, I think, like the truth lies somewhere in the middle. But Phoenix was very effective. Uh, knocked out most of the VCI, and I think if started sooner, uh, it might have had an uh, impact in a different uh, scenario for the war. Just a couple of minutes left in our conversation, sir. After you came home uh, from your tour, what did you do for the rest of the war? I went to Berlin. I was assigned to the Berlin Brigade for a year, and I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Uh, sausage, beer, and being in Berlin, uh, you didn't go out to the field because there was no field. You're in the city. You, you drive 10 miles in any one direction, you hit the wall. So one, uh, there was no patrols, uh, at least for the infantry. Uh, you had politicians come in every once in a while and you'd have to march for them. But that was a small price to pay for being uh, in a place where you could smoke at night without worrying about a sniper pinging one into your brain. You could laugh out loud. Uh, for the young 19, 20-year-old guys coming back from Vietnam, you had all these blonde, blue-eyed German fräuleins. Uh, it was great. <laughs> it was great. And then later, uh, after the war, you pursued a legal career. Yes. And eventually became a judge in the Los Angeles Superior Court. Yes. And talk a little bit about that. How do you think your military experience prepared you for that, Benny? You know, um, for would-be employers, I think it's a good idea for someone, if possible, to have military experience as an officer because at 23 years old, you were leading 100 men in the most... Uh, lethal enterprises there are and and that's without the normal personnel problems about someone getting a dear job letter or uh, his, his mother gets sick and she's back home uh, the army experience really helped me i after law school i became a deputy district attorney a prosecutor for los angeles but again this is an i came back in 1970 and the anti-war uh, movement was at its height. So I'm in law school with a lot of these young kids that were wealthy in the center of privileged individuals. Uh, looking down on, at soldiers from the Vietnam War, too many people had begun to blame the war on the warriors. I didn't like that, being around people like that for three years in law school. But, you know, it was just the way of the world at that point in time. It's not like now where someone at the airport will say, ah, thank you for your service. You know, did that. you engage those students in debate or did you largely stay You know, again, I was conflicted. I mean, yeah, it made me mad because uh, they didn't know, I think they're just arrogant. Uh, they didn't know what uh, their fellow Americans were going through. But at the same time, I said, you know, I should join those protesters because that's a stupid war, and it's un unwinnable. And if a young captain can think like that, uh, it would seem to me that most of the administration and the, the federal government should think of it that same way. And ultimately they did, but uh, like anything else, they tried to put a positive spin to it. But uh, we weren't going to win that war last minute of our conversation. Uh, you also started the Japanese-American Vietnam War Veterans Memorial. Uh, talk about your passion for Japanese Vietnam vets. I went to Washington, D.C. for the opening of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in 1982. And I looked and I saw the names of a lot of men that I knew. There was, I think, a stereotype for Japanese Americans. Other people thought they went all went to college. They became dentists, lawyers, or CPAs. And yet, there are about we we estimate maybe five thousand Japanese Americans served in in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I wanted to to honor them, uh, so I got together about nine, ten guys. Say, hey, let's do it. And it took uh, a number of years. But uh, now there's a Vietnam Veterans Memorial in uh, Los Angeles, 
at the uh, Japanese American uh, community building. So I'm, I'm gratified about that. Sir, we thank you for your time with us today. We thank you for your service, most well, of all, thank you. to our country. We've been joined by Judge Vincent Okamoto. He is a veteran of the U.S. Army and a veteran of the Vietnam War, the most highly decorated Japanese-American to survive the Vietnam War. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.